In the early morning hours of June 1st, a thousand white Tulsans gathered on the northern edge of Greenwood. Minutes later, a siren wailed and the invasion was on. Thousands of white men poured into Greenwood. A machine gun was placed on top of a grain elevator and fired into Greenwood onto any black Tulsans car that moved. Thousands of people came here just to watch and take pictures on the southwestern edge of Greenwood and riders divided into smaller groups and once they reached homes and businesses they would shoot the lock off and once inside they would take any valuables and smash everything else and pile the bedding and furniture and set the house ablaze. As the fires moved along Archer Street, homes were ignited, telephone poles, power lines were toppled or also set on fire. As soon, all the power was out in Greenwood. As the morning wore on, the buildings on Archer Street disintegrated or burned out and new fires were carefully started so that they avoided the white homes on the other side of the tracks. The police seemed intent on helping the mob rather than protecting black citizens and V.B. Bostic, a black deputy, stated that the white officer drove him and his wife from their home, poured gasoline on the floor and set their house on fire. Some of the officers then changed out of their uniform into plain clothes and led the groups into Greenwood. In reports after the riot, the police chief Gustafson spoke about people setting fires that didn't have on uniforms but did have on stars and badges. In the court testimony, he testified that he did not implicate his own officers but suggested that the special police started the fire. We were unable to limit the commission to our choice. They might have lost their head and applied a torch, but it was positively in contradiction to our orders. Also, while the Tulsa Fire Department did not join in the riot, they relented to the mob. The fire station responded to a call at 2 a.m. on Main and Archer, but as firefighters attached their holes to the water plug, several white Tulsans pointed guns at the firefighters and told them to stay away from the holes or else someone would get killed. The fires raged in the background as the men disengaged their holes and went back to the fire station and went to sleep. When the next alarm sounded, the firefighters just simply didn't leave. It wasn't until the next Next day, when the fire department would attempt to do their jobs, and still they were no match for the mob who was setting fires as the firemen were attempting to put them out. The riot overwhelmed the blacks in Greenwood and left them with very few options. Some continued to mount in armed resistance, while others tried to hide anywhere they could. Many attempted to escape on foot by walking the nine miles to Sandy Springs or other communities. Saving your assets was simply not going to happen. Survival was your only option. So black men and women ran through Greenwood in their night clothes, bare feet, sometimes carrying their children in their arms. Even when blacks did surrender to somewhat peaceful guardsmen that didn't guarantee your survival. A.C. Jackson was one of the most prominent surgeons in America and one of the leaders of Greenwood. When he attempted to surrender to a group of white men as Jackson walked out of his house with his hands raised up in his air, the small mob approached him and two whites fired their guns into his chest. As they walked away, they shot him in the leg and then they set his house on fire with gasoline. With homes now defenseless, the mob rummaged through the drawers and cabinets and celebrated their good fortune. Black Sheriff Barney Cleaver, when he left the courthouse on June 1st, he saw two white women carrying his wife's clothes. And the rioters attempted to justify their looting of Greenwood because they felt like blacks had amassed their wealth in some illegal underground economy that allowed for an inferior race to prosper and that black success was intolerable to the social order of white supremacy. So in taking their position, Possessions, put them back in their place and tip the scales back in proper alignment. Therefore, looting the homes of these uppity blacks was a reason for celebration. 914 a.m. General Charles Barrett from Oklahoma City had 190 National Guard and soldiers arrive in Tulsa. By then, most of the destruction was done and they struggled to restore order because it was 10,000 plus rioters in the streets. So General Barrett ordered additional troops from nearby towns. Meanwhile, he allowed the state troops to eat and didn't oppose martial law until 1149 when the riot was effectively over. Also, 
the National Guard had some of the most intense gun battles with the blacks of Greenwood. Between eight and nine, the police requested urgent assistance of two units to stop black men on the northern edge of Greenwood from firing into white homes. 150 guardsmen would show up with rifles and pistols and were met with immediate fire from a group of blacks in Greenwood. The battle lasted for over 20 minutes, but the group was overwhelmed, began to retreat into buildings within Greenwood for cover. They barricaded themselves into a few houses and refused to stop firing before they were eventually killed. Later, the Mount Zion Baptist Church was rumored to be a house of armaments for the blacks in Greenwood, a rumor of 20 caskets that had been taken into the church that were full of rifles. Whether this was true or not, the building was sturdy and provided an excellent fortress for anyone that charged the church were quickly repelled by the gunmen inside. One heavy firefight that morning lasted for over an hour. So seeking greater firepower, the white Tulsans called on the National Guardsmen and they quickly arrived with a flatbed truck with a heavy machine gun on a tripod. He fired for five or six minutes to the belfry collapsed and the rest of the building was set on fire. For the blacks of Greenwood, it was impossible to determine the difference between the National Guard and the mob because they were both fighting the black population. Another added dimension to the invasion was the element of aircraft that were flown over by the mob that swept over Greenwood in the early morning. The exact reasons for their presence was under debate, but numerous blacks said that the aircraft were used to assault Greenwood and pilots either dropped incendiary devices like turpentine or dynamite or strafed black victims using rifles. Walter White wrote, Eight planes were employed to spy on the movement of Negroes, according to some, were used to bomb the colored section. But the police would state that they were only used to monitor fires and to locate refugees. In a final humiliation from the mass destruction of Greenwood, black Tulsans were removed from what was left of their homes at Greenwood, lined up in the street with their hands raised up in the air and marched out of Greenwood. Men, women, and children were carrying bundles of clothes and personal items on their backs or in carts with the jail full. They were sent to the convention hall. Armed guards had to hold white crowds of the blacks of Greenwood were brought in and some businesses even gave their employees the day off to celebrate nigger day. When the convention hall was full, the blacks of Greenwood were taken downtown to the fairground. By Tuesday, June 2nd, 6,000 blacks had been consolidated onto the fairgrounds and an area that was once used to groom cows was now transformed into their sleeping areas. In the aftermath, the safest black man at Tulsa was Dick Rowland himself, who stayed in the jail under guard all night and wasn't taken out until the next morning, never to return to Tulsa. Later in 1921, the case against Dick Rowland was dismissed after the Tulsa County attorney received a letter from Sarah Page stating that she did not want to press charges. Due to the chaotic nature of the Tulsa massacre and the fact that many victims were buried in unmarked graves, estimates of casualties resulted in a wide variety of answers. The Tulsa Tribune reported 31 deaths, including 21 black and nine white, while the Los Angeles Express reported 175 deaths. In 2001, the Oklahoma 1921 Race Massacre Commission reported that 36 people died, 26 blacks and 10 white. Today, the Oklahoma Bureau of Vital Statistics report that 36 people had died. However, based on the verbal and written accounts of survivors and the American Red Cross, some historians estimate the death toll as many as 300. Even by the lowest estimates, the Tulsa Race Massacre remains one of the deadliest race-inspired riots in United States history. The entire 36 blocks of the Greenwood Commercial District were destroyed. A total of 191 black owned businesses, churches, a junior high, the district's only hospital was lost. According to the Red Cross, 1,256 homes were burned and another 215 were looted and vandalized. The Tulsa Real Estate Exchange estimated a real estate personal property loss at $1.2 million, which is the equivalent of $30 million in 2020. Very few claims were paid because most of their policies excluded riot damage. Witnesses in a lawsuit brought by property owner William Renford testified that at least some officers and in many special officers commissioned by the Tulsa police participated in the destruction of Greenwood. However, no one could say for certainty that officers had acted under the direction of local authorities. As a result, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled against Renford and in favor of its insurance company. That decision effectively ended hundreds of lawsuits and damage claims against insurance companies and the city of Tulsa. 
In the decades following the massacre, the details of the Tulsa Race Massacre remained largely unknown for decades. It was not until the dedication of the Tulsa's Reconsolidation Park in December of 09 that there were organized efforts to commemorate this event. Instead, the incident remained largely covered up. Articles from the day of the incident that sparked violence had been removed from the archive copies of the Tulsa Tribune, later copies from 1936 and 1946 entitled 15 Years Ago Today and 25 years ago today, make no mention of the Tulsa massacre. It was not until 2004 that the Oklahoma Department of Education required that the Tulsa race massacre be taught in Oklahoma schools. In 2006, 75 years after the incident occurred, the Oklahoma legislator appointed a Tulsa race riot commission to create a historically accurate account of the riot and documented the causes and damages. In 2018, the commission was renamed the Tulsa Race Massacre Commission. The commission appointed historians and archaeologists to create oral and written accounts and to share possible locations of mass graves of black victims. Archaeologists identified over four likely locations of such graves. However, no bodies have been found until July of 2020 when Oklahoma archaeologists uncovered human remains on top of a success expected mass grave in a city cemetery. Despite attempts to suppress details of the rioting, the commission stated that these are not myths or rumors or speculation. This is an historical record. In its final report, the commission recommended a payment of $33 million in reparation to the 120 verified survivors and descendants of survivors from the Tulsa Race Massacre. However, the legislature never took any action and no reparations have been paid. In 2002, the Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry private charity paid a total of $28,000 to the remaining survivors with each getting $200 a piece. Thank you. This has been One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Patreon page and my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.